Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Ellen Webb with the Center for Environmental Health. We'll go ahead and get started. On behalf of the Center for Environmental Health and Reproductive Health Technologies Project, I welcome you all to today's session, which is the first session in our six-week webinar series. In this series, you'll be hearing from leading national experts in reproductive and developmental health. We have speakers presenting on a broad range of topics, on everything from endocrine disruption to the impacts of fossil fuels to the effects of climate change. In particular, we will be discussing resource extraction and energy production, and how this may contribute to adverse reproductive health and developmental health effects in humans, especially as it relates to maternal and fetal development. We are pleased to have with us today some great participants. In a moment, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Sheila Bushkin, who will be moderating today's session. Before I do, I would like to introduce Dr. Bushkin. Dr. Bushkin is a medical physician and public health and environmental health professional. She is a member of the Institute for Health and the Environment at the University at Albany. Dr. Bushkin is a member of the Medical Society of the State of New York and has been since 1998. Her specific areas of interest involve chronic disease, aging, environmental health, and continuing medical education. So welcome, Dr. Bushkin. I will now turn this over to you so we can now begin. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, I appreciate uh, the kind words. <laughs> I'd like to offer a very warm welcome to all of our listeners today throughout the United States and overseas as well. Um, I'm delighted that you have found the time to join us for this webinar. We have great speakers who are about to um, teach us some new and, and very valuable information about reproductive and developmental health. And I personally can't wait to hear them speak. Um, I would like to let you know that uh, they have no, neither of them have any relevant financial relationships and no conflict of interest. I'd like to introduce Dr. Frederica Pereira first. She's a, a doctor of public health and a PhD and is internationally recognized for pioneering the field of molecular epidemiology using biomarkers to understand links between environmental exposures and subsequent disease. Currently, she and her colleagues are applying advanced molecular and imaging techniques with longitudinal cohort studies of pregnant women and their children with the goal of identifying preventable environmental risk factors for developmental disorders like asthma, obesity, and cancer in childhood. So these include toxic chemicals, pesticides, air pollution, with a particular focus on the adverse effects of prenatal and early childhood exposures. Her areas of specialization include prevention of environmentally related developmental disorders and disease in children and cancer prevention through the use of novel biomarkers and also environment uh, susceptibility interactions and also risk assessment. Her research um, is also addressing multiple impacts on children's health recently and development of fossil fuel combustion from both the toxic pollutants that are emitted and also from the climate change that's related to the CO2 emissions. She is the author of over 300 publications. Personally, I don't know where you can get the time to have that many, but I applaud her for that and for sharing all of her knowledge with us throughout these um, extensive publications. And this includes 290 peer-reviewed articles. And she's received numerous honors. So it's my really great pleasure to introduce Dr. Pereira to you. And um, Dr. Pereira, oh, uh, one little thing I'd like to ask the audience, please. I know you're going to have questions and issues that you'd like to discuss further. So if you could just hold your questions until the end, we'll have a panel discussion at the end. So let me introduce Dr. Pereira. And Dr. Pereira, you're free to get started. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bushkin. I'm uh, honored to be here. I think this will be a very interesting uh, webinar. And uh, I'm warning you that I will be taking a very broad look at the problem of fossil fuel emissions. 
and talking about the many different impacts of these emissions on children's health development and future. Uh, because I feel, and I know most people feel this way, that too often policymakers do not consider the full impacts of energy and environmental policies and the benefits of intervention. Uh, now, how, uh, sorry, I'm just having a few little minor things. No, no problem. So I'm going to um, convince you that there's a case for an integrated, try to convince you that there's a case for an integrated assessment and a sharper focus on children as the moral lever for policy change. Um, and I've come at this through years of, of research uh, and thinking about the problem of fossil fuel and, that, and noting that climate change and toxic air pollutants have already inflicted disproportionate suffering on children and are seriously endangering their future health and well-being. And that we need a fuller accounting, not only that, that looks holistically at all the problems, but that addresses the major issue of inequity. The, the disproportionate burden on the poor and the young and the disparities regionally and socioeconomically in impacts and then think, thinking together about the escalating threat to future generations. And <clears throat> I make this uh, uh, mention of the moral lever for policy change because um, what we need is a, a, an investment, uh, a sense of individual investment in the problem and that comes, that's really a, a, a moral dis decision. And I think the deeply held uh, value of protecting children and providing a pure environment for them and for their development does provide that moral engagement. I'll come back to that at the end. There's broad scientific consensus that the earth is warming rapidly and, 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 and at an accelerating rate. And that uh, CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels is a major cause of this warming. There's really no scientific dispute. And I've cited some, just some of the references down below uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and that people who are uh, socially, economically, culturally, politically, institutionally marginalized are especially vulnerable to the health impacts. And that's true of climate change, especially in developing countries with low income. Um, pollutants emitted by burning of coal, oil, <clears throat> diesel fuel, natural gas, even natural gas, are linked to increased mortality, cardiovascular disease, adverse birth outcomes, cognitive behavioral disorders, respiratory disease, and cancer. And children, especially in low-income communities, are, the, are, are suffering the most. <clears throat> The uh, b burden of environmental disease does fall on poor children. Um, the WHO has estimated that a third of the global burden of disease is caused by environmental factors and that children bear the greatest brunt of this, of this uh, uh, burden, uh, more than 40% uh, uh, of the burden, even though they represent 10% of the world's population. Um, they also estimate that more than 88% of the existing global burden of disease of, from climate change is borne by children. And we think about the, the numbers of people in the world who are poor, living in poverty. It's a billion children or half the world's children are poor. And in the U.S., 22% of children are poor with uh, obvious disparities in poverty, African American, Hispanics, uh, um, having a much higher uh, incidence of poverty or living in poverty far more frequently than whites. <clears throat> now this slide uh, summarizes or really the point I'm trying to make. It's that fossil fuel burning does affect ch children and their health development future uh, through these different avenues of emitting toxic pollutants, and I've listed them here on the left-hand side of the slide, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAH. Uh, PM 2.5 is particulate matter of a, of a small aerodynamic diameter, 2.5 microns, and therefore deeply respirable, can be inhaled deep into the lungs and uh, deposited there or uh, circulated systemically once, once the um, chemicals are, are absorbed or removed from the surface of the carbon particle. 
uh, also black carbon, mercury, a neurotoxicant, and the gas is sulfur and nitrogen oxides and volatile organic chemicals. And all of these pollutants have defined uh, health risks to children, and especially many of them <clears throat> when <clears throat> exposures are taking place prenatally or in early childhood. Um, fossil fuel burning obviously is the main cause of uh, release of CO2 and, and uh, a driver, a major driver of climate change. And these two uh, different factors can interact to heighten risks. For example, ozone, ground level ozone, um, is a respiratory irritant that is formed as a secondary pollutant when the uh, nitrogen oxides and volatile organic chemicals are released and they, they react to form ozone. And this uh, process of uh, secondary pollutant formation is accelerated at higher temperatures. Uh, and so we can see how one uh, potentiates the other, and that's just one such example. The sources of both carbon dioxide and <clears throat> air pollutants are well known to us. We see them every day in, uh, in our lives. Uh, 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 diesel and gasoline-powered vehicles, trucks, buses, cars, uh, the smokestacks that, uh, uh, from plants that are burning fossil fuel uh, for electricity, for industry. And then <clears throat> on the right-hand side, a, from a building here in northern Manhattan, a plume of black smoke coming from a residential boiler burning uh, fuel oil that is uh, particularly uh, dirty. And then uh, we have uh, diesel buses that were uncontrolled in New York City. I'm happy to say they've been largely, all of them, converted to a cleaner fuel and with, uh, with good results in terms of air quality. And then in, in developing countries, there's the indoor burning of fossil fuel and, uh, and, uh, and uh, other few organic fuels for, uh, for cooking and heating. The, the fetus and child are known to be uh, far more susceptible than adults to uh, toxic chemicals and to climate change. And the reasons are that uh, because they are so rapidly developing, they're more biologically and uh, psychologically vulnerable, uh, both to nutritional deprivation, uh, but also trauma, infectious disease agents, environmental contaminants. Uh, and, uh, and because their detoxification and immune systems are, are immature. So we have uh, not only greater absorption retention, but less defense in terms of biological mechanisms to clear, uh, safely clear uh, toxic chemicals or, or uh, offset buffer the effects of stress. And then uh, chronic diseases that are seeded early in life have so much time to develop and impair health and well-being. We have to think about health over the life course resulting from these early exposures prenatally and in the first years. Um, damage, uh, we're now learning that damage from in utero postnatal exposures can be inherited transgenerationally. And epigenetic mechanisms are now understood to play a role here. Um, that uh, with studies mostly experimental showing a transgenerational inheritance not only of the epigenetic change but of the uh, actual damage that was incurred uh, by the great grandmother. There, uh, coming to that point of disproportionate exposure in low income populations, uh, they're often living in areas that are most vulnerable to climate-related hazards, like uh, low-lying areas prone to flooding, or areas where uh, desertification is taking place, and, um, and so climate-related hazards are greater for them. Also, sources of ambient air pollutants are, are disproportionately cited in lower-income communities of color, and this is a national trend. We see it in New York City, even, where the, the greatest number of diesel bus depots and uh, truck uh, waste transfer stations, truck depots, have been cited in northern Manhattan, uh, communities that are already interlaced by heavily trafficked bus and truck roadways. Uh, also, uh, low-income communities have experience of more material hardship, poverty related and psychosocial stress and poor nutrition and have limited capacity to adapt to climate change or to offset the, uh, the effects of ambient air pollutants. 
the different types of stressors that I'm mentioning here, the physical toxicants uh, and the stress due to psychosocial stress, often interact to magnify the adverse health effects that are experienced. Uh, also, um, it, as we've mentioned, global climate change and pollution exacerbate the striking socioeconomic inequalities that already exist in children's health within countries and between countries. This is a rather long list of the observed effects of climate change in children globally and in the U.S. So this is not a problem of just one region of the, of the globe. It's affecting people everywhere, even in developed countries. Not so much malnutrition, but, uh, but certainly vector in, in developed countries, although that still does exist. But vector-borne diseases, like Lyme, in our country, Lyme disease, in developing countries, malaria. Also, waterborne disease with higher rainfall and leading to contamination of drinking water. <coughs> and remember that uh, one, almost two million deaths a year, mostly in young children, are caused by diarrhea. Uh, foodborne illness from higher temperatures. Is it showing the notes? It's not showing the notes. Oh, I forgot to advance the slide. I'm sorry. Um, so foodborne illness from higher temperatures, physical and psychological trauma from uh, extreme events such as weather events like hurricanes Katrina and Sandy, which were a real wake-up call to us uh, in the U.S. Uh, seeing the devastation from those events, and respiratory illness, uh, asthma exacerbation results from increased ozone mold and pollen in the presence of higher temperatures and uh, other changes attributable to climate change. And heat-related illnesses, we've already seen uh, evidence of those around the world and in the U.S. and Europe. The uh, observed health effects of air pollutants from burning of fossil fuel, it's also a fairly long list here, which you can read yourselves, but it, it ranges from infant mortality to allergy and asthma, respiratory illness, infections, uh, cognitive and behavioral, disorders in children, obesity, cancer, and this is uh, not the full list. Um, and so um, we have to be very thoughtful that it not only does a single pollutant cause one of these effects, but a single pollutant, any one of these can have multiple effects. Any one of those listed at the top of the slide can have multiple effects. The costs of climate change and air pollution are large, have been inadequately accounted for, I, I believe, but I think that's going to change. Climate change has uh, increased the frequency and intensity of weather-related disasters, and an approximate uh, 66 and a half million children worldwide were directly affected by floods, droughts, cyclones, or hurricanes, and 600,000 of them died every year from 1990 to 2000. So every 10 years, 600,000 deaths. <clears throat> the estimated health-related costs of just six climate change-related events in the U.S. In, over a seven-year period, 2002 to, to nine, were estimated at 14 billion, and the annual health care costs at 740 million, again, annual. And that's just from six climate change-related events that were studied. And EPA has estimated that the avoided health costs that have been prevented by the U.S. Uh, clean air amendments uh, are, are, esti are estimated to reach $2 trillion for the year 2020. So significant benefits of those regulations and up above significant costs, uh, health and uh, financial costs from uh, in events from, due to climate change. I'm going to now uh, turn to our international cohort studies that we've been carrying out with colleagues around the world at the uh, WE, meaning the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health, which I direct, and my many colleagues. So I will be reflecting the work of a great many people here. But these, these uh, cohorts include... A preg uh, include a, can you see my arrow? Yes, I hope you can. Um, a cohort in, in Krakow, Poland, in China, and also in, the, in New York City. 
our studies in New York City and elsewhere have uh, focused on a number of pollutants, contaminants, not only synthetic chemicals, but air pollutants due to fossil fuel combustion. So I'm going to restrict my, um, my talk to the uh, pollutants that are released by burning of fossil fuels. Every single type of fossil fuel releases polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which sound lovely, but uh, they are toxic in many ways, including carcinogenic. And we are looking uh, very closely at the uh, associations between exposures prenatally through the mother's inhaling uh, air that is contaminated with these pollutants and, uh, and a number of different adverse outcomes in the children listed on the right-hand side of the slide. So uh, they are uh, diverse uh, health effects, making that, uh, illustrating that point that I mentioned earlier. And we use biologic markers and molecular epidemiology to, as linkers between exposure and outcomes wherever we can. So I'll come back to this bio biologic marker that you see in the middle, this uh, scheme of the double helix of DNA and a black uh, blob in the middle, which is the, uh, it's a cartoon, but it signifies one of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which uh, once inhaled by the mother can uh, be systemically distributed and, and then cross the placenta and bind to DNA, forming this fingerprint of exposure. In the study in New York City, we have, uh, well, I'm going to t carry you through the steps on the right. So you see the sequence very briefly. I'll, I'll explain what, what, what's been done. Women are, uh, are enrolled uh, in prenatally uh, in, during pregnancy through the clinics associated with Columbia and, uh, and uh, are outfitted with a backpack monitor, which in, uh, collects air at the breathing zone and deposits uh, the material in, uh, in the air on, the, on filters to measure different kinds of contaminants. And here she's being fitted. Um, here's that biologic marker that we measure in uh, umbilical cord blood, mother's blood, and in children's blood later on. Uh, we also measure biologic markers in urine and, uh, and some in placenta. The children are evaluated at birth and then again uh, when they are well, every six months to uh, a year to two years, but using a different developmental test, you, you see a child being assessed for, uh, for uh, psychomotor uh, development, uh, but cognitive development and behavioral development are assessed using uh, age-appropriate instruments, and uh, spirometry and uh, lung function tests, that is, and other um, instruments are, are uh, used to learn about their symptoms of, of asthma and, and respiratory, other respiratory symptoms. And in uh, some recent studies, MRI imaging has been used to investigate whether there are any changes, anatomical or functional changes, in brains of children who are exposed to different pollutants, in this case, uh, PAH. So I can show you that I'll just run through very quickly on the left the fact that we have observed that women are prenatally exposed to higher levels of PAH. Remember, these are the combustion-related air pollutants. Um, their uh, babies have reduced birth weight and uh, smaller head circumference, Deve more developmental delays at age three. Um, we've observed IQ reductions at age five that are in the ballpark of those seen with, with low-level lead, and so of concern for their academic uh, futures and um, ability to learn. And uh, we also have observed behavioral problems like symptoms of anxiety or depression as we follow the children. And I will come back to ADHD as one of the outcomes we've studied more recently and mention that even uh, obesity has been studied in our cohort. And uh, the first search report was from uh, investigators here at the center showing a link between prenatal PAH exposure and obesity at ages five and seven, and that work has continued and continues to see effects on measures of obesity, uh, and has also been um, replicated by other studies or confirmed by other studies. Uh, asthma and allergic sensitization has been observed in association with prenatal PAH and also postnatal PAH in combination. 
and MRI brain changes, which I'll come back to in a little more detail. And I should mention that all of these associations are significant after adjusting for potential confounders. Uh, uh, I'll touch a little more in a little more detail on the ADHD findings. This is a recent paper. It came out in November of last year, um, reporting that high uh, maternal adults. So this is that fingerprint biomarker I showed you earlier, but this time measured in maternal blood at delivery, so re reflecting exposure during the prenatal period, um, and is a, a kind of um, biologic dosimeter of, for the exposure the mothers received and through her the baby. So high maternal adducts were significantly associated with um, behavior problems related to ADHD. And a, a very targeted test, the Connors Parent Rating Scale, was used to elicit this information about the child's behavior. And this, the adducts were significantly associated with the inattentive uh, scale, subscale, and with total ADHD. And those results suggest that exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons encountered in the air in New York City may play a role in childhood ADHD behavior problems. The next uh, study, just recent, very recent, oh, this is 2015, we should change that. Um, it's uh, a, a report that came out in JAMA Psychiatry, I guess, last week or the week before, and reported effects of prenatal exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons on the development of brain white matter cognition and behavior in later childhood. This was a, a small study, uh, 40 subjects, uh, 40 children. And the uh, findings suggested that prenatal exposure to PAH contributes to slower processing speed, ADHD symptoms, and externalizing problems in urban youth, and does that by disrupting the development of the left hemisphere white matter. Uh, white matter has, uh, sorry, uh, white matter had for a long time been thought to be just passive, not doing very much of anything, but is now understood to be very important in, uh, in how the brain learns and functions and the areas affected by the uh, reduction in white matter in the left hemisphere are important for attention and impulse control. This work is being expanded uh, in, throughout the whole cohort, not just the 40, but the whole group of children being followed. And um, so that will be important to, to uh, learn about the uh, further effects, including the functional um, uh, MRI results associated with early exposure to PAH. Now, um, we've, I mentioned that we've carried out a number of uh, birth cohort studies in these different settings, Krakow, New York City, uh, Tongliang in China, and we see uh, for birth outcomes, consistency across the studies, uh, uh, less favorable birth outcomes, effects on IQ cognition across all three studies, and for the two that we've, where we've looked at this, the uh, effects are associations between prenatal exposure and asthma respiratory symptoms or illness. Now, I want to turn to uh, some rather po more positive news for you, uh, intervention studies uh, two, of two, nature, two types in China. Uh, the first is a study in the city of Tongliang in Chongqing, China. And this, uh, in this city, the, uh, a power plant was located quite centrally and was burning coal uh, without any controls whatsoever. So it was a highly polluting, smallish plant, but highly polluting. And, uh, and the uh, government decided that such small, inefficient plants, polluting plants, should be shut down. We took advantage of that so-called natural experiment, not really natural, but that experiment, governmental in intervention. And I mentioned that the study director here is my colleague, Dr. Delian Tang, who is right now in China. So um, full credit to him. And uh, we uh, were lucky to be able to enroll a cohort before and a cohort after plant shutdown. And, uh, and to look at the different uh, health outcomes in the two different cohorts and compare them. 
as well as compare our biomarker of exposure the, uh, that I showed you earlier. It's called an adduct form by PAH and DNA. <clears throat> and you can see that first, this is the first baby born in the cohort, number, cohort one, and here is the same child taking the gazelle test at age two and concentrating very hard. So what we saw when we compared the, the two cohorts was quite striking. Comparing the, the first, uh, the second cohort, post-closure cohort to the pre-closure, we saw a significant drop in, the, in that biomarker, the cord adduct levels. Uh, we also saw that ambient levels of PAH were significantly reduced. Uh, we no longer observe significant associations between the adducts as a measure of exposure and lower de developmental scores. Uh, and another piece of positive uh, news was that the levels of a protein, a neurotrophic uh, protein, a brain-derived neurotrophin, uh, BDNF for short, were significantly higher in the second cohort, and that, that uh, BDNF is instrumental in, in early brain development, in development and, and uh, differentiation of neurons and formation of synapses, so that, that's a molecular signal of a benefit in addition to the molecular signal that, that the exposure was, was lower in the second cohort. The, the second intervention study in China is a, a, of a broader nature. It, it took place in the province of Shanxi in China, in Taiyuan. And for a long time, this province has been uh, one of the more polluted areas of China. It's uh, the number one coal-burning, coal-producing region of the country. And, uh, and was, uh, there was such concern about the pollution levels there that uh, over time the government has instituted some uh, policies to reduce coal burning with some um, apparent benefits in terms of the, uh, of the levels of air pollution. You can see over the period 2001 to 2010, uh, and this was work in conjunction with the China CDC and many other investigators in China, again led by Dr. Tang. And as in environmental policies were implemented, the levels of pollution came down from 196 micrograms per cubic meter to about 89. Now, the WHO standard is 40 micrograms per cubic meter, so there is a way to go, but this, uh, this result is encouraging. And um, our colleagues and, and we calculated the attributable number of cases due to particulate matter and put them on the same slide here with, um, with PM10 concentration. So you see the decline in the black line for, uh, for particulate matter, and you see the, the trend for premature death, chronic bronchitis, ER visits. Just these few outcomes were looked at. And the estimated benefits, economic benefits, were large, 3.8 to 6 billion yuan, depending on how that was calculated, and that translates to as much as 1 billion US dollars. So quite a striking benefits from, these, from this intervention, and uh, the work goes on, and we're continuing this study. Summarizing the evidence, we see that climate change and fossil fuel pollution have affected children's health globally and in the US. Poor children uh, especially bear the brunt. And all of this has implications for children's academic performance, lifetime earnings, health, not only over the life course, but for uh, that uh, health and well-being of future generations. And there is evidence that, uh, po that policy interventions work. I think this uh, calls, calls for a new paradigm and action to protect children now and in the future. And, uh, it would be a child, it should be a child-centered model of sustainability. Uh, that puts children and their future uh, and future generations at the very heart of our environmental, social, energy, and climate policies. And uh, this is, I believe, mandated by those things I mentioned, the greater vulnerability of children, the long-term effects of these exposures, and the striking disparities that need to address them. And this would be a science-based paradigm with the broadly shared value of children's well-being uh, providing the ultimate moral driver for policy change. So um, 
uh, lack of such a paradigm and holistic view has resulted in piecemeal and fractured accounting of the risks and also of the policies that are not so far integrated. And, uh, and this has led to an underestimation of both the urgency and the benefits of taking action. And there's a quote by David Bull, UNICEF's UK executive director that I think is very apt here. We're hurtling toward a future where the gains being made for the world's children are threatened and their health, well-being, livelihoods and survival are compromised despite being the least responsible for the causes we need to listen to them. So children don't have a voice, we have to give them a voice and we have to listen to it. I want to acknowledge uh, my many collaborators in this work. Um, sorry. <laughs> oh, another slide, but uh, actually just one more quick reminder that <clears throat> other people have made this comment in 1987, the report of the Brunton Commission that we need to uh, we need to protect children's fundamental right to a healthy life enhancing, enhancing environment that was speaking about climate change and uh, the seventh generation to come principle constitution of the confederation of nature's uh, nations of the Iroquois from as early as the sixth century so I'd like to acknowledge my many uh, colleagues uh, at the center, all of the many investigators, and I've not been able to list all of them, our part community partners and, uh, and our collaborators in China and in Poland, and our funders who have been uh, so uh, staunch and, and uh, supportive all these years. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll look forward to questions. Uh, hi, well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Pereira. That was really very sophisticated slide presentation and very uh, interesting news about the new cohort studies that are being done, which uh, now give scientific credibility to, I guess, our worst fears and suspicions that we've had for many years. So thank you so much for presenting that so beautifully. Now I would like to introduce um, Dr. Suzanne Fenton, PhD, um, who is also internationally acclaimed and also a very prolific author of peer-reviewed scientific uh, findings that she shares with her scientific and medical colleagues. Um, at, she's a group leader at the National Institute of Health, the Reproductive Endocrinology Group, the Mammary Gland Development, and lactation biology. Dr. Fenton is a, is a reproductive endocrinologist working at the National Toxicology Program Laboratory, which is within the division of the National Toxicology Program at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Her work focuses on the role of environmental chemicals in breast development timing as it relates to the onset of puberty increased susceptibility to breast cancer, and altered lactational ability. And so now, um, Dr. Sue Fenton, we would be so honored if you would begin your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I'm going to continue what Dr. Pereira um, was talking about. So about in the middle of her talk, she mentioned the impact of fossil fuels, and the last thing on her list was cancer. I'm going to focus on that for the next uh, 25 minutes or so and really talk about how important early life um, vulnerable, vulnerable stages are in terms of exposures in children and their long-term, lifelong uh, reproductive health impacts. Um, as you may know, about one in eight women, 12% of women over their lifetime uh, may be diagnosed with breast cancer. And I really want to talk about breast cancer as an example today because there's been a strong focus on this in uh, the last few years. And I really feel like I, I want to keep the wheels under the bus turning. Uh, we're really, um, there's some strong evidence that uh, a very small portion of cancers, breast cancers, are familial or inherited, and, and then it's genetically based. Um, and most people suggest 
15%, all the way up to, on this slide, 27%, which leaves about 75%, or 73 on this slide, left to lifetime or lifestyle and environmental um, factors that may modify risk for breast cancer. And these would be sporadic cancers that would um, develop over a long period of time, typically over a 40-year, 50-year period. Bre the breast is kind of interesting because it actually develops very late in gestation in the rodent model and um, in the last part of the first trimester in the human fetus. The, and, the, and the development is very similar. Right here I'm going to show you a mouse mammary gland development um, where the mammary bud develops about a week before the, the fetus, the offspring is born. The mammary mesenchyme, which, or which is the fat that surrounds the breast epithelium, develops um, early. And the mammary bud grows into that. By the time the animal is born, shown here on um, embryonic 8, 18 and a half, um, the, an the mammary epithelium actually has a branch to it and has um, integrated itself into the fat pad. So it's receiving signals from um, multiple different kinds of cells. And when you look at the mammary gland as a whole mount, which where we take the entire gland out of the animal, we put it on a slide, and we can see all of the mammary epithelium growing in that fat pad. On the left, you can see um, before puberty occurs, there's a small amount of epithelium growing in the, in the, uh, on the left-hand side of the mammary gland, and it's going to grow to the right. Um, and if, as puberty um, comes about, it is growing very rapidly. The epithelium is growing very rapidly, and this is a very vulnerable stage for the mammary gland until it fills the fat pad during adulthood, shown on the right. But the mammary gland is a really complicated tissue. Um, it receives messages or signals from a lot of different types of cells. And so although, you know, when you think of person having breast cancer, that would be primarily in the target site, which is the mammary epithelium, as shown at the bottom, it's actually getting signals from the blood vessels, the adipose tissue, stromal cells, and inflammatory cells um, over a lifetime. And all of these different types of cells can receive different types of signals from the environment. Hormonal control of the breast is, is, seems pretty simple. When you, when you first begin to study it, it, it it's often, um, estrogens are often blamed for breast cancer. But they're, they're part of the picture. So estrogens, progesterone, prolactin, and several growth hormones are involved in the process of mammary gland growth and development until it reaches the um, adult stage. All of these are have specific kind of um, roles that they play, and they have specific receptors. Um, and there are environmental factors that may hinder the correct action of those receptors in the cell. But now when you look at version B of hormonal control, it gets a little interesting. So there are so many um, signaling pathways involved in growth and proper growth and development of the mammary gland, you can see how there would be, it would be easy to uh, alter this kind of normal progression of growth and development with all of these targets in, in line. One thing that we do know from the rodent um, research um, is that <clears throat> there are multiple time points in development of the human and rodent mammary gland that have, share similarities. Shown in the yellow here, the mammary epithelial bud, uh, I just showed you that, develops in the human at the end of the first trimester. Often women are not really thinking about their environmental exposures at this time of pregnancy. Um, many people don't even know they're pregnant at this stage of pregnancy. In the rodent, that happens about a week before birth, both in the rat and the mouse. And these make very good models for human um, breast development. <clears throat> the branching and the canalization of the epithelium, which is kind of what's, what's shown at, at birth. I showed you a couple of slides ago. That is very similar also. So at birth, in the rodent and in the human, 
there is a branched epithelium present in the breast that's grown into a fat pad and that will grow at the same rate as the body um, for uh, until it re starts receiving the hormones of puberty. When that happens, terminal end buds be will be present, or TEBs. Um, this would happen between seven or seven to thirteen years old in a girl, and about twenty-three to sixty days old in a rodent, depending on the rodent strain and species. So there are there. Are, the progression of growth is very similar, and I want to just talk about the um, terminal end bud just for a minute because the terminal end bud is pretty, pretty important in the mammary gland in the breast. It is a, it, it's a teardrop strip shaped structure that's um, present before vaginal opening in the rat and before menses occurs in a girl, and it's present through young adulthood. Um, it may be seen in rodents for, um, you know, up to 40 days. It's several um, epithelial cell layers thick, and it stains intensely. When we, when, we, when we can put it on a slide and look at it, it will stain intensely, as shown in the top picture here. And in the rat, we have specific ways to measure it, and in the mouse also, there are specific ways to measure it that we know we can count these and understand how many are present for how long. These are highly mitogenic. Um, they are rapidly dividing, and they are the source of new ducts in the gland. So these are going to cause the, the gland to grow all the way to the end of that fat pad. They contain stem cells, and stem cells are often thought to be the target site for cancer. So clearly, uh, and, and from some very beautiful studies by Jose Russo and, and Irma Russo, um, they showed that depending on the number of terminal end buds present at the, in the breast at the time of um, carcinogen exposure, that, will, that can, may determine how many tumors form later in life in a rodent model. So we clearly don't want terminal end buds and these proliferating structures in a girl to be um, around for very long or to have access to um, carcinogen exposure. Shown here is a uh, image taken from the Interagency Breast Cancer and the Environment Research Coordinating Committee report um, in 2013. This um, interagency panel, expert panel, um, came together to um, understand better the environmental factors affecting the breast and breast cancer incidence and to highlight some of the research gaps and ways that we may change funding, training, so that we may uh, further the field of, of preventing breast cancer. Um, but the point here is that there are a lot of similarities between the human and, and the rodent species. Because, and then this is really important because I'm going to show you evidence from the rodents of environmental factors that may enhance breast cancer susceptibility or change breast cancer development. Um, and, and as you can see here, especially um, in puberty in the in like Carolina blue, we have terminal end buds present for three to six weeks in the mouse, four to six weeks of age in the rat, and from about seven years old, I guess now for, until uh, fourteen or sixteen years old in the girl. So in terms of carcinogens that affect the uh, breast and affect breast cancer, um, we're talking about a pool of about 84,000 chemicals that are um, sold on the market and registered with the um, Toxic Substances Control Act. These um, chemicals have very few of them have actually undergone a two-year bioassay, which is um, a traditional cancer assay that would detect mammary carcinogens. So only about 1% to 2% of these chemicals have undergone um, study, or six or 650, 600 to 650 now at the National Toxicology Program. Uh, and, the, and these animals are tested in adult rats usually or, and or mice. So sometimes they would have a reason to test in mice also. But out of these, the, there are about 250 that have shown um, that have caused cancer. And in 2007, Silent Spring Institute um, reported that 216 chemicals 
um, whether or not they were from the two-year bioassay or not, have been identified to cause mammary tumors um, in at least one lab. And of those, 60 chemicals cause mammary cancer in one or more species in a two-year bioassay. I mean, the fact, they may also affect other sites, but I'm focusing on breast cancer right now. So of those, six substances are in the report on carcinogens that may, may, may or do cause breast cancer in humans. Um, and the, the ones that they report are shown here. Um, some that you may be familiar with are diethylstilbestrol and um, um, hormone replacement therapy. But others, um, such as ethylene oxide, um, may also, it's a, a man-made chemical. But carcinogens aren't the only cause of worry for the breast. Endocrine-disrupting compounds have many targets in the breast, and that's why I personally am worried about them, because there are many endocrine um, glands, organs, that affect breast development and are needed for normal development, and they're shown here. So all of these glands and their products um, may be increased or decreased based on endocrine-disrupting compounds. And for those of you that aren't familiar with endocrine dis disrupting compounds, EDCs are environmental factors, or usually chemicals, that af may affect normal hormonal homeostasis in some way. They am may affect hormone binding, um, receptor activity, or metabolism to um, alter the normal uh, function of that receptor. There are several compounds or several chemicals that have been shown to cause developmental um, delays in mammary gland development. Two are shown here. ATR is atrazine, and TCDD is dioxin, which is a PAH that uh, Dr. Pereira mentioned earlier. That's a very toxic one. Um, these two chemicals can delay mammary gland development, and shown here, on the left is postnatal day four, which is four days old in a rat. Day 33, which is about the time of puberty. You can see in the center um, photo that the two glands have been delayed in growing together by atrazine at the dose shown. And for dioxin, it's even more of a delay. This is a lipophilic persistent compound, whereas atrazine has a shorter half-life. And in adulthood, you can see the the um, persistent delays that are caused by these chemicals. When you delay mammary gland development like this, you, uh, the terminal end buds, those, those critical sites for cancer development, are present for longer than they should be in the gland, leaving the animal more vulnerable to the effects of a, a carcinogen exposure if it were to occur during this time. From many, many studies, we now understand there are certain, um, there are certain critical or vulnerable um, windows of, of development in the breast that increase their sensitivity to either a carcinogen exposure, a, one that we've given on purpose in a rodent, or carcinogen exposure in a human, and it may also lead to lactation impairment. So if exposed during gestation, puberty, or pregnancy, there are multiple levels of evidence that chemicals may um, enhance breast cancer formation and lead to a lactational impairment. In addition, if, if gestationally exposed or exposed during early life, oftentimes pubertal mammary gland development will be disrupted, which, like I just said, may lead to um, cancer if exposed to a carcinogen. Shown here are just some examples of the chemicals that have been um, demonstrated to have effects on the mammary gland. You may see your favorite one here or, or not. Um, this, there, you know, there are several been reported recently that are not on this list. Um, for example, arsenic should probably be on this list. And many of these chemicals have been um, shown to be the most, the mammary gland has been shown to be the most sensitive of the reproductive tissues evaluated in studies with these different um, environmental chemicals. 
And shown here is just a synopsis of a few of those. So atrazine, bisphenol A, DDT, genistein have been shown to be have been shown to um, sensitively target the mammary gland in rodent studies, and that's only that's not only true in female but also in male studies. And I'd like to show you some um, information that we've gathered recently on um, on the male um, rat on some of the chemicals that are actually used in or, or um, that are found in groundwater um, that are not supposed to be in groundwater. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go. So about, I don't know if you know a lot about male breast cancer. Not a lot of people do. So I'm just going to go over that briefly. Less than 1% of all breast cancer cases are in men. It's about 1 in 1,000, whereas in women it's 1 in every 8 women. So it's much less common than female breast cancer. It's estimated about 2,000 new cases are diagnosed each year in the U.S and that men usually develop breast cancer in their 70s or and older, and that most of these men usually have a family history of breast cancer, cancer or carry a gene, gene mutation that would make them more susceptible. Um, recently, many men, um, now over 80, closer to 90, I think, um, men that either lived at or their mother lived there while they were carrying them, at Camp Lejeune have developed breast cancer in their early life, and these men tend to have no family history of breast cancer. Camp Lejeune was the site of a major water contamination um, from volatile organic chemicals from the late 1950s through 1985. Marines and their families drank and bathed in this water um, for, a period, from, for over a 30-year period. Ten wells were taken out of service due to this contamination of VOCs, and the basis for this contamination was um, several. There was off-base dry cleaning company, on-base units that used these chemicals to clean the military equipment, and there were also fuel storage tanks that were leaking from underground that, that they um, were close enough that they could have contaminated these wells that the people were drinking from. And there are many known potential disease outcomes from exposure to VOCs, and um, some of them are listed here. In a recent study in my lab, which is unpublished, and I'm asking that you do not cite or copy this, um, we have exposed rats to five and ten times the level that was shown in the well water. Um, and the, the amount that's shown in the well water, that was in the well water, shown in the blue in the bottom. So these animals were exposed from gestation day 12 to postnatal day 48, which covers the entire range of the, like the vulnerable period for mammary development. And as you can see above on the top, um, the top two graphs are in females. In female rodents, we saw um, precocious or accelerated mammary gland development in the postnatal day 48 animals, shown with the asterisks, they were significantly accelerated, whereas we didn't see that at postnatal day 23. But in the males, that was a slightly different story. We saw more accelerated um, development in the males um, earlier. So male mammary glands um, definitely respond to this mixture of volatile organic chemicals at levels that are only five or ten times higher than what these people drank. We did not expose these animals um, to inhalation of these VOCs, which would have led to a much higher body burden. Um, so, this, so the level that they were exposed to was only through the drinking water. Um, and so um, we have allowed these animals to go on to form uh, mammary tumors, and that, that data is um, still being analyzed. But this um, demonstrates that the chemicals that are in the that were in the water at Camp Lejeune are biologically active in terms of being an endocrine disruptor for the mammary gland, um, and so you know there's a potential for the, uh, for um, latent effects of this um, exposure. And last, I just want to uh, close with a couple of thoughts. There are examples that we know of already where 
um, early exposure to chemicals in the environment have led to breast cancer later in life. And the earlier you're exposed, the more apt you are to be um, at a higher risk for breast tumor development. Two, two examples are um, dioxin exposure in Seveso, Italy, where one, they've documented delayed breast development in adolescents with higher doc, um, circulating dioxin, both in Seveso and in the Netherlands. And there are reports of increased risk of breast cancer with um, high, the highest levels of dioxin exposure in um, when they were children, when people were exposed as children. DDT is another example, and work by Barbara Cohn has shown that the earlier um, women, the younger women were when the peak DDT exposures occurred, the, inc the higher their risk for breast cancer was um, later in life. And so environmental factors that cause breast cancer don't just have to come in the form of mammary carcinogens, although several mammary carcinogens will be talked about in the coming weeks, such as benzene and vinyl chloride and trichloroethylene or TCE. Um, diethylstilbestrol and acetonostradiol also are uh, pharmaceuticals that um, enhance breast tumor development. Um, these chemicals might also increase the window of time that the terminal end buds are present, leading to risk of um, enhanced disease risk from future carcinogen exposure. So we know of several chemicals that can do this, and many of the chemicals that are used in alternative energy sources haven't been evaluated for their effects on mammary gland development or for endocrine disrupting activity. And this is important because they don't just affect the epithelium. They can modify the stromal makeup, which could lead to a, a, a permissive environment for mammary, gland or mammary cancer to develop. Or they may affect the stem cell population directly, um, increasing the risk over a lifetime. And with that, I just want I'd like to close, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Fenton. That was a, just a, a very excellent lecture, and we enjoyed seeing all the work that you have been doing with your colleagues. Um, I think we're going to open this up now for questions. And actually, I have a couple of questions that I'd like to start out with um, that I've received. So here's one question. This one I'd like to direct at Dr. to Dr. Pereira. And the question is, how, how do you know that it is the fossil fuel pollutants that are the problem? So couldn't there be health effects that you observed in your New York City and your Polish and your China cohort studies that are due to other confounding factors? Well, certainly there's always that possibility of residual confounding. In other words, confounding by uh, factors that we haven't adequately adjusted for. We do make attempts to, to control for, that is, in other words, take out the effect of uh, secondhand tobacco smoke, by the, because all the women are non-smokers in our study by design, but 40% do have exposure to secondhand smoke, uh, which could also contribute both to PAH and to the adverse effects that we're concerned about. Um, so we, uh, we take account of ETS, environmental tobacco smoke exposure, also dietary uh, exposure to PAH. We uh, have the, those data from questionnaires. Um, we adjust for other known neurotoxicants and also for various socio-demographic, socio socioeconomic factors, mother, mother's education, uh, in the neuro, neurodevelopmental uh, analyses, the quality of the home caretaking environment postnatally, which of course can be a very, very important factor in child development, uh, and uh, and so and stress, uh, maternal demoralization, a response to stress. So, in many different uh, covariates are included in the models, so that we don't uh, spuriously conclude that that the effect is all due to uh, PAH. Um, so that gives us some confidence. Uh, we also um, look across studies to see whether our results are consistent and also look at effects over time. 
Not that we always expect to see the same uh, of observed outcomes related to early exposures because the children are developing and we are looking at further with uh, more rigor and more targeted, more specificity at certain outcomes. But we, we look to see a, a consistent pattern of uh, either persistent or, or emerging uh, out, uh, adverse outcomes that um, are, are, could have been predicted or consistent with what we saw earlier. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to ask a question now of um, Dr. Fenton. Dr. Fenton, why has it been so hard to identify environmental causes of breast cancer? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think there's two major reasons. One is because the, the breast is pretty complicated and it takes a long time for breast cancer to develop. Um, and, I, and I think these critical periods of development have been key um, times of, of understanding the exposure, and we don't have much data on that. You know, we have a lot of information on at the time of diagnosis of breast cancer of what woman, a woman might have been exposed to, but what she was exposed to during the critical periods of breast development, we don't have a very good understanding, and that's why we need to... Uh, limit the exposures during those times, so hopefully we can uh, decrease the incidence. And, and the second reason, I think, is because we're exposed to such a mixture of chemicals. Um, you know, some at, at higher levels, it's, but I think that is part of the, of the issue, why it's taken so long to uh, kind of pinpoint some of the bad actors. Well, that, that was a great answer, and you kind of hit the nail on the head there. I was going to ask both of you about mixtures of chemicals, because uh, there are studies that show that well over a hundred industrial chemicals are found in the umbilical cord blood of almost all babies being born today globally. So, um, you know, I was wondering if you know of studies or if you are involved in studies that are beginning to look at um, the synergistic or at least the additive effects uh, or even the neutralizing effects of uh, multiple chemicals you know mixed together and that being said you know I'd like to say that we all know that the mixtures of chemicals are unknown in terms of concentrations or quantities every single baby and every single person has a different exposure profile and different uh, chemicals that they uh, that become persistent in their system so that they're already born with chemicals on board and then they get exposed to more chemicals as they you know breathe the air drink water eat food drink milk um, so it's it, it's a hard thing to do but do you know of any studies either of you that are being done to begin to evaluate the um, you know the effects of more than one chemical several chemicals together um, I can I can jump in Frederica Pereira uh, we ourselves well my colleagues are actually looking at that question and uh, are working with uh, collab uh, collaborators colleagues in Europe and, and elsewhere in the US to develop models to look to uh, estimate the effects of mixtures. Um, what we have done so far in our cohort studies, because there's there's limited in size, there there uh, in the New York study was 720 some women and and 720 babies who were enrolled, and you can see that we don't have the numbers to be able to look at at uh, really in a definitive way at interactions, even two-way interactions, in other words, with two exposures in the model in terms of in their interaction, much less three or four. But uh, it, it's very interesting that we have observed interactions between certain exposures, paired exposures. Um, for example, I've been focusing on PAH uh, interactions with uh, secondhand smoke or environmental tobacco smoke have been observed on neurobehavior, on respiratory health, respiratory effects, um, and, uh, and also, interestingly, interactions with uh, psychosocial stressors, uh, 
material hardship or maternal demoralization in our studies, interacting with air pollution. Um, so the, there's still much work that needs to be done, but it is ongoing. I can't cite chapter and verse, but I know uh, there's a, a lot of activity in the area of mixtures. Um, I, but I think I it's helpful to, 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 to you know, we, we're all taking a sort of stepwise approach to, to the problem. And well, that manage. sounds, you know, very, very methodical and yeah. that's the right way to go about it scientifically. And I think that I hear Dr. Fenton would like to contribute something here, too. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the VOC study that I talked about here is a good example because we are not finding the same um, exact trends in these chemicals, both in their body burden and in how long they stay in the body, that kind of thing, in terms of what was reported initially, like as a chemical when they were tested, we're not we're not finding that they're acting the same as they did when they're given individually. So I think this whole issue is very important because when they are together, they may act differently because they may be modified by the same metabolizing enzymes or they may be hitting the same receptor, and the receptor can become saturated and different effects can occur. So I think this um, evaluation as a mixture is very important. And I know that the at UCSS, at University of California, San Francisco, there are some really interesting studies. They're just a measuring what the mixture is that people or children are exposed to and then testing the active components of that mixture. So I think they're going about it, you know, backwards. They're looking at what are we being exposed to and what in that mixture is, is active and in, and in what way. I think that this is a very, um, a great topic for future webinars. <laughs> yeah, uh, I agree. It sounds fascinating. I have another question for Dr. Pereira. Mm -hmm. On one of your slides, um, you mentioned evidence of interactions between other stressors, um, such as those due to poverty and um, pollutants. So what evidence do you have about that that you would like to perhaps share with us <laughs> of your well, own work? Uh, sure. Well, that's, I, I was alluding to that in my last comment, that yeah. we have observed such, uh, such interactions in the Polish cohort with maternal demoralization, which itself was correlated with material hardship or uh, deprivation due to poverty and uh, exposure to air pollution. Those, those babies who had uh, experienced, whose mothers had been exposed to more pollution and to more um, maternal and, and, and had more reported more demoralization during pregnancy uh, and also after the delivery were more likely to have neurobehavioral problems like uh, anxiety or, or being withdrawn, depression, and, and even some externalizing problems. Uh, that was one example. And then in, in, uh, in the New York City study, uh, we reported an interaction with secondhand smoke and material hardship and also um, between air pollution and material. And that was on development at the first of ETS and material hardship uh, interacted on developmental delays in children measured at age two, so very early on in the study, and then follow up and, uh, at age five of, uh, excuse me, age seven of children's IQ outcomes uh, showed a similar kind of interaction, but this time with the PA, we were looking at the PAH exposure prenatally, interacting with material uh -huh. hardship. So there, this is not, and there are a number of such studies that are now uh, in the literature uh, reporting this, uh, and, and obviously this, these kinds of interactions are very uh, important in thinking about the disparities that occur in, in health outcomes, uh, the greater burden of disease and developmental impairment borne by the least, least advantaged uh, populations. In some of those studies, have you also noticed like multiple organ systems affected, for example, in children that may have neurocognitive and behavioral uh, social disorders? Are, are there, for example, other things like cardiac defects that they are born with or um, pulmonary like asthma, you know, more greater likelihood to have asthma, greater likelihood to have obesity? In other words, the chemicals 
I guess the question I'm asking is that the chemicals, the multiple chemicals that they're being exposed to in a kind of a multiple, you know, ingredient soup, um, could affect many different organ systems at one time. And I'm just wondering if you're seeing that as well. Well, we, we haven't actually been asking the question, are the same children affected by these outcomes, but asking the question, uh, and that would be something interesting to look at, but we're asking, are the same, are, are, is the same exposure, is the same chemical or pollutant exposure? And remember, we're also studying a whole host of synthetic chemicals, um, but that's another story. Uh, we're asking whether that exposure is associated with multiple adverse outcomes in the cohort. And the answer is yes. And, and that uh, slide I showed earlier listing the different outcomes that we see in association with PAH uh, is demonstrating that fact. So right. this comes to, to our concluding that there are, are, are enormous benefits, I mean multiple benefits, and uh, that would come from reducing exposures to, to these pollutants. And uh, there have been estimates, for example, well, the, what most, the best estimate of the uh, monetary benefits is for lead in this country. That's been done beautifully by Schwartz and others. And then um, we recently did the same for a hypothetical reduction in, in PAH exposure and levels in New York City and monetize those benefits. Well, that sounds excellent. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Fenton, um, you know, a lot of people just, you know, are very concerned with breast cancer because it's so common. So is there, and also we're beginning to see, it's been, you know, it's been discussed quite a bit in the literature, that we're beginning to see earlier onset breast development. So uh, I was wondering if there's a link between early onset development of the breast in, in young girls and then the later development of breast cancer in life, and maybe at what, what point in life, in their 40s, 50s, or is it in their younger, like maybe 30s? Are you seeing anything like that? Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. And actually, the, um, the NIEHS is supporting several um, centers that are evaluating that question. So, so it, hasn't, it hasn't been asked before. You know, we, we always knew that there was a link between the time of menses or the first period and um, in increased breast cancer risk. And, you know, the earlier you um, became, you know, the earlier you had a period, the increased risk for breast cancer. Um, but the question on breast timing hasn't been asked. One reason, I think, is because only until recently, within life, like the last 20 years, has there been a big gap between the time of breast development and menses. So there's been a couple papers by Frank Biro, um, Anders Jewell, um, in the Scandinavian group. Um, Frank's group is, is in um, Cincinnati and at Kaiser Permanente in California and at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, they have all been reporting a bigger gap between the timing of breast development and the your first period um, in girls. The shift hasn't been nearly as severe in boys, but I think this is a prime um, endpoint for more information. More information is needed because it's very possible. Because we know that, in, like in rodents, we already know that there's a there's a increased susceptibility when those terminal end buds are present in the breast. And if girls are developing breasts earlier and the terminal end buds are present and it takes them longer time to, for, to fully develop, that would lead to increased risk of carcinogen exposure and multiple other endocrine just exposures, endocrine disrupting exposures. So this gap that's formed in the last 20 or 25 years has really brought that question to the forefront. And I think that it deserves a good bit of attention quickly so that we can, you know, ameliorate, you know, if there, if there if intervention is needed, then we intervene. But um, unfortunately, we won't know the answer to that for uh, probably about 25 more years. Right. 
it's very alarming, though, to think about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question also for Dr. Pereira. Um, so, with Dr. with with the climate change that we see globally, um, but it seems to be you know m there's climate change. You know the differentiation between actual climate change and then the localized uh, component of air pollution and other pollution that we see around a particular uh, industrialized urban community. So, isn't a climate change a problem? more of developing countries rather than rich countries like the U.S. We may have more protections and more public health measures that we take into uh, consideration because we, we know that we have a lot of pollution. Well, of course, um, uh, developing countries, low-income populations around the world bear the brunt of climate change, and I, I did mention the reasons. The, um, the most serious effects, greatest effects associated with climate change so far are malnutrition, vector-borne disease like malaria, uh, and waterborne diseases from contaminated drinking water, contaminated by uh, sewage and other waste, um, and, uh, and, yet, and, and trauma. But the two greatest ones today are killers and uh, also causes of uh, morbidity are malnutrition and, uh, and vector-borne, waterborne disease. And those are most greatly felt in developing countries, that's true. However, we uh, have seen in this country uh, increases in Lyme disease uh, with the change in climate, and uh, most, more, most of the cases are seen in children. We've also seen foodborne illness in Europe and, and in this country associated with higher temperatures. And we've seen the physical and psychological trauma from the hurricanes, Katrina, Sandy, and also some of the, uh, from some of the forest fires that have occurred um, uh, to which uh, climate change has contributed. And, um, and then respiratory illness, asthma exacerbation, more ozone, more mold and pollen, that's uh, been seen here in this country. Uh, and so, and heat-related illnesses also, and I cited a, a couple of statistics on heat-related uh, episodes in the U.S. and and number of illnesses and the, and the economic cost. So, where I think years ago we thought, well, that's them and not us, that's their problem. Uh, and we had a vision of islands going underwater and, and uh, children who were particularly at risk because already they were... Uh, you know, suffering from food shortages and other and, and bad environmental conditions. We now see that this is it is a global problem, uh, and we need to act globally. And, and and of course, our country has contributed along with China. I guess we're now number two. China's number one contributor um, to CO2 emissions. Uh, we, as that last quote in my slide uh, showed. We are, we are mainly responsible, developed countries are mostly responsible for these, uh, these effects, uh, for these harms and this growing threat uh, that is facing the whole world. So that's uh, a rather long answer to your question, but well, it, isn't, it isn't simply a, a question of a problem for the developing world. Right, exactly. And, and of course, global climate change uh, brings different quality of changes to different regions and when you mentioned Lyme disease you brought to mind something that I heard that I thought was quite fascinating as the weather patterns and the deforestation patterns have changed in the temperate areas of the Northeast uh, corridor here like in New England and Long Island um, the ecosystem changed such that the larger um, predator animals like wolves and, and animals like that and wild cats, they began to disappear. That allowed the, um, the deer to continue, the deer population to expand. And the deer population really serves in a sense as the transportation system for the infected ticks to get from the grassy areas to the suburban areas and, and elsewhere. So with less, uh, with ecosystem changes, 
occurring because of the changes in, in the environment around us. Um, certain changes have occurred which have encouraged the development of ticks and tick-borne diseases and the animals that transport the uh, contaminated ticks to the human population. So I thought that was you know, pretty fascinating and so when you mentioned that I wanted to share that. And mm -hmm. I think I have one last question for, for Dr. Pereira here, although we are getting some more questions that are coming in. Um, I mean this question is for Dr. Fenton. Um, is there evidence to suggest that the chemicals used in developing alternative energy sources might increase breast cancer risk too? Well, I, 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 I know that some of the volatile organic chemicals are used in the, um, developing alternative fuel sources, um, such as ben benzene was one of the chemicals in our mix. Um, vinyl chloride, trichloroethylene, these are used um, in fuels. They are um, present in the cleaning material, the, the, the chemicals that are used to clean the equipment with, um, and they get into the water source. These chemicals have a slower degradation once they get into those water sources than they do um, in, like, say, surface water where they can um, off-gas or volatilize. Um, so there is evidence that those chemicals are being used, and there's evidence that they have increased mammary cancers in rodent species and in occupational situations in women. Um, whether or not the link has been made from their current use in alternative energy sources directly to breast cancer hasn't been made yet, but there's lots of indications that there may be um, trouble on the forefront. Yes, uh, another may, alarming may, area. May I, I ask a I'm, question, uh, uh, Dr. Wynn? Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, by alternative energy, what do, what do you include in that? Do you include natural gas? Um, what, what do you I, include? Okay. I, <laughs> I'm generalizing a little bit because I, I know that these are used in um, fracking. Yeah, so you're so thinking of natural gas as a, an alternative energy source. Uh, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and I think of it as a fossil fuel. <laughs> um, I, I do, and, yes. And not as a renewable or, or alternative energy, So, but I think your yeah. comments are, are you're, you're really talking about fracking, and I would only add that in addition to NOx, uh, nitrogen oxides, the VOCs that uh, that uh, uh, Sheila mentioned, and um, there there are the um, uh, diesel particles, PAH emitted by the machinery that is used to in the process of fracking, um, right. hydrogen sulfide and benzene and so forth, um, and then of course uh, methane is released during fracking which is a very potent climate-altering gas. And right. even, though, and I, even though natural, sorry, oh, even sorry. Though natural I, gas uh, is cleaner in terms of CO2, it's emitting uh, 117 um, pounds of CO2 emitted per million BTU of energy, and that's uh, about half of what coal, coal burning emits, but nonetheless it's a significant amount. Right. And I, I guess the only thing that I, we haven't really talked about that I wanted to make mention of and I kind of forgot was um, some of the um, heavy, the metals mm -hmm. that are in the soil that are released um, into the water system, such as arsenic, cadmium, uranium, mm -hmm. so that we know affect the breast and have endocrine disrupting activity. And um, to add to that, there's also radio radioactive material being released as well which is very persistent in the environment. Radium for example has a half-life of 1600 years <laughs> so once it's released it's like uh, we have a new legacy of an increased amount of a radioactive material uh, in our environment something that our future generations will have to deal with in terms of exposures. Now Ellen did you have some questions also? 
Yes. Well, I think actually, given the time, we're going to actually start to wrap up. But if it's okay with the speakers, um, what I'll plan on doing is um, there are additional questions here that have continued to come in during the Q&A session. So I'll send those questions to you all um, after this. So we'll make sure that the attendees have their questions answered. Does that work for you? Mm -hmm. Okay, that great. That would be great. Sure. Okay. So thank you, um, Dr. Fenton and Dr. Pereira, for your excellent presentations. I think we all learned quite a lot. And Dr. Bushkin, you did a terrific job moderating. So thank you all for that. Um, we hope um, all the attendees um, have benefited from the session and have learned some useful information. We will be administering a final survey um, over the next couple of days. So we ask if people can please take a couple of moments to answer these questions. These help us improve the work that we do. Um, and also, the recordings and slides for the presentations will be up on the CEH website at a later point, so we will notify all participants when those are available. So please also remember to register for next week's session, um, where next week we'll be discussing researching the link between reproductive health and unconventional oil and natural gas development. So while today was a more um, general overview, uh, next week we'll be um, a more, more specific topic dealing with unconventional oil and natural gas development and research. So again, thank you for joining us, and we really look forward to having you all back uh, next week and for future sessions. So um, thank please, you. thank you again. Thank you too, Ellen. Thank you for coordinating a, a really great meeting. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. Yes, my thanks also.